I want to tell people that the, this is information that pretty much was in f place before the budget crash, the economy crashed a couple of years ago. The recession did hit harder and uh, earlier in Los Angeles County than in much of California. It has, LA has the highest homeless population in the country with demographics that are actually fairly appalling. 9% of our population is African American and 50% of the homeless are African American. Um, for example, and 20% of the homeless adults actually have full-time jobs. Unemployment in Los Angeles is now, after all the census workers have been laid off, is about 15% that they've admitted to. Um, and among blacks, it is closer to 20, and black and Latino youth about twice that, although they're not really saying. Um, public schools, public housing, public libraries, and public parks have been battered by cuts for years, um, and now it, they've stepped it up. In LA, like the rest of the country, the public education system and libraries, health facilities, and parks are actually a really disappearing thread for a decent life for in Los Angeles, which is a huge immigrant, African-American, and very poor working population and youth. LA's public school before the cuts already had a system where 50% of black students did not graduate and 60% of Latinos didn't graduate. When I spoke to Omar Hussein from the March 4th committee, he's a young physics teacher at one of LA's biggest and poorest schools, um, said that they've lost, they have had cuts already and are going to lose more teachers, not just due to the budget, but because the immigration raids and the border wall and the constant presence of the border patrol have lowered the overall student numbers because people are no longer making it to Los Angeles. And if they are here, their parents are sometimes afraid to send them to school at all. The district now has 10% of their student body in charter schools, and that number is growing. The result of that is that 10% of the money is taken out of the public school pool and the charter school, and that means teachers get laid off. A longtime teacher, um, Jeff Pott, who I actually met by reading the internet, <laughs> um, he described how teachers have been fighting to defend public education for years, and he wanted me to convey, because I told him I was reporting to the convention, he wanted me pe people to all understand actually how the charter system works and why it's privatization. He says big business and the government don't want to actually stop funding these schools. They want to transfer the public money to private hands, that private hands can then run the schools as they wish and die, deny entry to whoever they wish and keep out unions. Then they can speculate with the profits. Charter operators now can choose the students and they are not required to educate special education students and can reject hundreds of categories of students for people who they claim are, quote, at risk. At risk can mean you are an English learner, you're living with a single mom, you have a parent in jail, you are in the foster system, or you are homeless. These students are then the responsibility of what's left of the remaining public schools. For example, the richest neighborhood in Los Angeles is Pacific Palisades. They have a pub of charter school, which is publicly funded, a publicly funded, essentially private school, which operates non-union, and of course they don't have any pension or other responsibilities, for all the rich kids from the neighborhood. That's, anyway, then I spoke to our neighbor. We do not live in Pacific Palisades. We live in South Central Los Angeles. I have five minutes left. I have five minutes. Okay, um, our neighbor says, he's 11 years old, his name is Arthur. Two years ago, he was in a class with 15 other students and four teachers. Now, he's in a class with 25 students and two teachers and no homeroom. The teachers' unions have, and then I'm on the teaching assistants, this is from our comrade Sam, who is a teaching assistant and a graduate student. He's, um, he's a member of the Los Angeles branch and could, wanted to con submit this. He said teaching assistants, graduate students, do a lot of work in the undergraduate education business. 
They can be expected to teach entire classes, create classes, help professors with administrative tasks, grade papers for the entire time they write their dissertations. This leads to great disparities between grad students, the ones with fellowships do less teaching, and they have additional time to travel to do research and more time for the solitary thinking, reading, and analyzing that's needed. Um, class sizes Class size increases doesn't mean there's an increase in teaching assistance, so their workload increases. Class cancellations means more teaching, less teaching assistance jobs, and fellowships are disappearing, uh, particularly in the humanities, which are under assault. He says mostly, though, the transformation of academic labor from the tenure model to a being permanent temps is the most telling, where you are hired year to year by the hour, sometimes with renewal forbidden with no unions and no benefits. Okay. Um, the teachers' unions have fought mostly to lessen the cuts but not to solve the problems that caused them, which is the, something we talked about in the labor resolution. Um, and I'm going to go to the March 4th committee, which you've heard about the birth of from Nancy. In L.A., it was mostly driven by um, public school students from K-12, city college students, and state university students. They were very loud and angry, and they were, it was driven mostly by low-income students and their teachers. It was citywide. There were most campus-based groups had representatives on it. Most of the campus, the students were also workers, and some were members of unions, um, and they were between 20 and 40 years old due to the difficulty it is to get through school when you have to have a full-time job. The left was there in many forms and were distributed on both sides of a battle that ensued between the students and rank-and-file workers and the bureaucrats who ran an alternative committee. Um, our committee was, alternate, was overwhelmingly female and of color. They got a head start in organizing. They actually got all the permits before everybody else did. Um, the education unions formed their own coalition of themselves and tried to catch up with the grassroots committee, um, which led to a battle royale between the two committees or who, over the nature of the protest. On the one hand, the union leadership announced there would be no strikes, that walkouts were illegal, and demanded that our committee take the word strike off our flyers and tried to keep our reps off the stage. On the other hand, the majority of the March 4th committee defended the membership of the United Teachers Union who had voted 90% to strike by invading their meetings and talking to members and organized for public schools to walk out and converge downtown to a rally organized an online petition which got tens of thousands of signatures around the state to, in a campaign to force the other committee to back down. Our policy was, our policy, FSP's policy, was actually to defend democracy in the movement and intervene to defend the young women of color who were raising these demands. We also called for taxing the rich and calling for broad organizing across the board to stop the service cuts. Okay, <laughs> all right. We tried very hard to form a united front with other left groups that we could identify, and we had some success working with a contact, um, working, cl uh, working closely with representatives of Labor's militant voice, and although we didn't know at the time of the Progressive Labor Party, they just didn't announce who they were. Um, but unfortunately, the group Solidarity members are the elected leaders of the United Teachers of Los Angeles, and ISO has many teachers in UTLA ranks and holds many low-level elected positions in the union, campaigned against a teacher's strike, and protested teachers accepting cuts to live on to fight another day. The good side is it gave us a real opportunity to compare our programs in public. Um, anyway, um, we emphasized everywhere, which wasn't difficult, the disproportionate effect these cuts have on women, immigrants, and other people of color. We invited two representatives of, of the committee to report at a radical women meeting. They showed up and gave a great report and invited radical women to speak at the rallies. <laughs> and it really did bear fruit um, for, for us to be there. This also, the mass rank and file pressure actually worked to a degree. On the good side, the union leadership was forced to back off, and L.A. March 4th Committee speakers got to get to the podium where they called for strikes as a method of saving jobs and saving schools. 
They did not, however, um, bu budge on the question of their own members striking, and more pressure is obviously going to be needed to get uh, the teachers able to use the most powerful weapon they have, which is to withdraw their labor. The rally itself in March was flooded with students from high school walkouts and walkouts from Cal State Los Angeles and from Cal State Dominguez Hills. Some people walked from Cal State LA. These are a lot younger than I am. These must have been like five miles, I think. Um, there's pictures up in the hospitality room of those rallies, which are quite exciting, and Sam's in some of those pictures. Um, I learned from this that the public arena is suddenly full of people who are mostly young, mostly people of color, and they want to talk to you about radical solutions. It gained us f a lot of friends. They have no time for backroom dealers or prevaricators, the kind of people who have every excuse not to acknowledge who they are and what they stand for. The other thing that has been said before, and I'll say it again, is that this battle is being led by women. And they're already, they already, uh, many are already socialists, but they hadn't met feminists before, socialist feminists. They're very conscious of the racism they fa face, but it wasn't until this committee brought it to a head with our help that they, haven't, they hadn't seen sexism as central to the fight they had to wage for leadership in the committee. Radical Women's been invited, um, and the FSP, uh, to participate in the Freedom Schools project, which some of the young women are holding over the summer on campuses as an alternative to the, to the city colleges, which have been canceled over the summer. And they took that directly from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And I also learned, interestingly enough, although they're mostly at least 30 years younger than I am, I didn't get the suspicion of older people that I am sure other people in the room displayed when I was their age. This was a lesson for us. They were very, they wanted help, and they took it from the people who were offering it. Okay. We had differences in strategy that are still open to debate, and Nancy talked about the no, the no program movement, whether, you know, occupy everything, demand nothing. Um, but the bigger question is whether to take on union bureaucrats directly by going to their rank and file or just refer, re, trying to get um, members of their union outside of those unions to try to pressure them. The other one is whether or not broad mass action, including strikes, is going to help or, uh, I mean, including strikes is the solution or the road to the solution of the problem or do we need to continue to endlessly lob, lobby the de Democrats. Um, there was, there's unresolved disputes over whether direct action with no building of an organization or a program is necessary, which I think is sort of what happened because there's no structure left to organize for next year. I think that nothing's going to get better as long as public sector unions operate separately, negotiate behind closed doors, and uh, cut deals for reduced cuts one union at a time. Um, and I also think working people and impoverished students, in this case they were the same people, really don't have any time for a movement that has no demands to make. And no demands means no socialist demands either, so that would curtail our ability to educate about the most important point at all. We need to demand restore the previous cuts and no cuts further to library schools, fire departments, pensions, and demand that our unions work together to build this movement. I do think the labor resolution's point about building from outside and inside the labor movement is really important. Yeah, it was a real lesson in how this can play out in this committee. And we need to be demanding jobs for all, regardless of immigration status. Otherwise, the best education in the world isn't going to get you a job in California. And, it will, and if there's no jobs or you can't work because you don't have papers. We need to go further in our demand to tax the rich and actually say how that would work, and it works in different states, depending on differently in different states. And it makes our call for socialism very logical. Our point is the wealth that is now in private hands, along with the wealth embedded in schools and hospitals and libraries, belongs to us. And this is a fight to get it back and to get what has been stolen from us and to keep what is left of public wealth in our hands really resonates with young people who face lousy educations, no jobs, and mountains of debt. This is also an opportunity to work with other left groups who will or to contrast our program with the groups that will not.